So remember last week we finished up Job 3 through 14, which was Job and his three friends, the first round of speeches uh, or discussion on Job's problem, the problem of suffering. And just a couple summary points. I'll go quickly through those, and then we're going to jump to some new material. Remember, Job is arguing, Job's friends are arguing points about God. Job is arguing about his experience with God. He's not arguing points. He's arguing about what he's experiencing. Second of all, in Job chapter 9, verses 33 through 34, Job says, There is no arbiter or mediator between us. You might lay his hand on us. So he's looking for a mediator. Uh, there's a little bit of redemptive historical foreshadowing there. that There needs to be a mediator, a divine mediator in our lives, someone that ultimately Christ will fulfill. Um, that word arbiter could also be translated uh, a daysman in, in the ancient Near East. And in ancient literature, a daysman, D-A-Y-S-M-A-N, uh, was an expression for an umpire or a mediator, someone who would call balls and strikes in life. Uh, so he needs some, represent- some representation. Uh, thirdly, if you remember in chapter 6, Job prays that it would, it would please God to crush him. And you see that same language used in Isaiah 53.10. It was the will of the Lord to crush, not Job, but Jesus. So a little bit of of literary foreshadowing, you might say, from Job 6, verse 9. It was the will of God to, uh, that he says that God would crush him. Isaiah 53.10, it was the will of God the Father, the Lord, to crush him, Jesus. Um, From the suffering servant, that's the suffering servant passages there in Isaiah. In uh, another point, in chapter 8, verse 21, Bildad asserts that God will not... He's telling Job this, remember, he's lecturing Job because Bildad knows all. Bildad asserts that God will not reject an innocent man. What do we see at the cross? We see that God does reject an innocent man because that innocent man, the Lord Jesus Christ, takes on our guilt, our sin. So Bildad's theology um, is a little bit off. Um, God does ultimately reject one innocent man on our behalf. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Um, Next point, Um, Job asserts his faith in God in the face of death in chapter 13, verse 15. Um, And this is ultimately what Christ does in the garden in Gethsemane um, before he's betrayed and arrested by Judas. Uh, He trusts in the plan of God the Father. He says, not my will but yours be done. Uh, He says, take this cup of of wrath, the cup of God's wrath on sin away, but Lord, I will do your will. So Christ is facing death head on. He knows what's coming. The Creator knows what's happening, what's coming from His creatures. And then, next point, Job demonstrates some measure of hope in life after death in chapter 14, verses 14 through 17. So there's a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, and and we know as we look back and study the New Testament that, that there definitely is hope of the resurrection. We know that John chapter 11, verse 25, when they're grieving over this friend Lazarus who's died, Jesus says to his friends Mary and Martha, the people who are grieving, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though that person die, yet shall they live. Christ asserts that. 1 Corinthians 15 is, is the, um, the locus classicus, the, the classic passage on the resurrection, that if Christ has done what we believe he's done historically, then there is the hope of the resurrection. And then finally, before we jump to um, the second round of speeches, we talked about this a little bit last week, actually, um, in our discussion. Job desires that his sins be, quote, sealed in a bag and covered. We talked about this last week. Uh, And this is really what atonement theology in the New Testament does for us as Christians. Uh, Our sins are covered. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, He, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Um, Hebrews 2.17, um, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation, to cover, expiate, remove the sins of the people. So you see a little bit of foreshadowing there um, as we take some theological points there from Job. So now let's look to some new material. Let's look at Job. We're going to look, we'll, we'll go probably halfway through this and then we'll stop um, so we can have some discussion. So I'll just talk for a little bit. We'll stop it at, in about 10, 15 minutes and have some discussion. Uh, Job 15 through 21, the structure of Job, is round two of these speeches between Job and his three friends. Um, 
round two. So you've already had one round of speeches, Job and, and one friend, then Job responds, and another friend critiques Job, and then another friend, and Job responds. And usually, generally speaking, Job's response is a little bit longer, maybe twice as long as his friends, emphasizing the literary context that Job gets precedent over his friends. So as we look here at chapter 15, Eliphaz speaks again. This is his second chance, and, and uh, Job's defense has become more vehement. His friend's words have become more severe. Um, Eliphaz, if you remember, began with some courtesy in chapter 4, kind of, let's try to, uh, you know, the Dale Carnegie method, try to go in soft and, and be a friend, and then you can bring in some more specific critiques. But now if you look at, at Eliphaz, he's more, he critiques Job directly. And the outline of Job's words in chapter 15 are, in verses 2 through 6, he says, Job, you are irreverent in your speech. Then in 7 through 16, he says, Job, you have empty claims to wisdom. If you have empty claims to wisdom, that means you're probably a fool. He's calling him a fool. And then finally, in verses 17 through 35, he says, Job, you need a reminder on the true fate of the wicked. I mean, that's a revival sermon right there. You need a true reminder on the fate of the wicked. Like, Job, if you don't clean this up, it's game over. It's, it's lights out. You're done. And so Eliphaz indicates he's hurt by Job's response. Um, he responds by telling Job, you're full, of, um, you're full of windy knowledge, hot air. Um, your words are, are meaningless. Eliphaz asserts that Job's words are unprofitable, and he will not dignify them by responding to them. He says in verse 4, your words are not only really stupid, they're also dangerous. So here you have a theological argument here. Earlier when Job's friends accused him of sin, they did not know what sin he was guilty of, but now, here's the transition, now they believe he is guilty of sinful speech. So now it's, okay, now we know what you've done, and that reveals your sinful heart. Eliphaz describes his speech using the words of mouth, tongue, lips, so they're basically now accusing Job of sinful speech. Uh, In verses 7 through 10, Eliphaz gives Job several direct questions. And what's interesting here to just highlight or make note of the questions that Eliphaz gives Job are very similar to the questions that God will ask Job in chapter 38. However, when the questions come from God, it brings healing. But from Eliphaz, they only bring more pain to Job. That's an interesting thought there. So remember, when Eliphaz is questioning Job, God's going to bring those questions to Job. Only when God brings those questions, it brings healing uh, and relief. Um, uh, and here you see an example of that the first man, he says, Job, were you the first man? He's asking if Job witnessed creation. In verse 8, Eliphaz also asks if Job has direct knowledge of God's divine secrets. Uh, however, Job has not claimed any of this. Um, and so they're really putting words in Job's mouth to defend themselves. Eliphaz is here. Um, Job, the only claim Job has made on this is in chapter 12, verse 3. He's claimed to be as smart as his friends, which I think is a fair claim, right? You don't want to be like the dumb friend, Right? You want, to be as e- you want to be equal with your friends. That's what, he's, that's what he's claimed. In chapter 15, verses 11 through 16, we see that Eliphaz is running out of new ideas. So he doesn't have anything to add at this point. Um, he has nothing new to what he's already asserted. Previously, Eliphaz gave a description of a good man's happy death in chapter 5, verse 26. Now he gives a description of the wicked's miserable life and early death. And he's using that for Job, a man who has lost everything. Not just a career, not just family, not just, he's lost everything. So again, it's always helpful when you read through Job, and it's hard to do, to put yourself in his shoes and say, what if everything was gone tomorrow? Everything. What would you do? And then you have these friends come over and say, yeah, your your speech is the problem. (laughs) Doesn't go over really well. These people would not be my friends uh, after this. Um, Once again, he's appealing to ancient Eliphaz's ancient and traditional truths, to talk about the good always prosper. Um, He says the problem with the wicked is that they have animosity and hatred towards God in verse 25. Um, He's asserting that they perhaps witnessed that in Job's life, but he gives no examples. And then at the end, in verses 29 through 30 and verse 32, Eliphaz returns to a familiar theme. He has nothing new to add here. The wicked will be punished and will wither away like a small plant. They're like palms or grapes, olives that never ripen. Uh, one, one scholar uh, that I think has been helpful on this, he observes the subtlety of how Eliphaz's speech ends right here. Eliphaz begins by essentially calling Job a windbag, talking about hot air from the east coming in. That's what he's saying. That's, that's the image of what he's saying. But yet, Eliphaz, he closes his speech uh, with 
what this scholar calls a pile of verbiage, a pile of words. He's just throwing words on, on here, empty words, empty words. So he's actually doing what he's accused Job of doing. That's the irony. That's the subtlety of it, which is interesting. He doesn't close with coherent points um, to conclude his argument. Um, he's not specific. Like one of the, for example, one of the, the pastors I enjoy listening to and have enjoyed listening to since college, um, when he, he's so specific in his points, when he gives an, he used to do this, when he would give an illustration, and I think I've done this before accidentally, he'd finish the illustration, then he would say, end of illustration. Now to our next point. I think I've done that a few times because it's in my brain. I'll probably do it this morning now that I'm thinking about it. Um, here, Eliphaz has accused Job of empty words. He just piles on empty words against Job. So he's doing what he's accused Eliphaz of doing, or what Job has done, accused Job of doing. And then finally, Eliphaz has refused to admit that sometimes the evil have unchecked prosperity. And sometimes good people suffer. He's refused to admit that. That's not part of the, the theological categories uh, in the mind of Mr. Eliphaz. Bad people can never prosper in this life, and good people always do well. And we know that that's not true. We, we know there's some general truths about how to live. That's what the Proverbs are, but the Proverbs, again, are not promises. They're general truths for living in God's created order, in his moral order. Um, so El, Eliphaz, the response to Eliphaz from Job is found in 16 and 17. He gets two chapters. And if, a quick outline is this. In 16 verses 2 through 5, Job attacks Eliphaz. Then in 6 through 17, Job claims that God is hostile to him. Again, this is a man wrestling with suffering. And then in chapter 16, verse 18, into chapter 17, verse 9, Job shows an amazing confidence that he will be acquitted, that he does not deserve, that he hasn't done anything to deserve this. And then chapter 17 finishes, verses 10 through 16, finished with Job discusses the meaning of death for him. The meaning of death for him. So Eliphaz's words to Job make it clear that he believes Job has acted wickedly, maybe still is. Um, we talked about that. Job maintains two specific truths here in, in spite of what he's being accused of. He says, I'm innocent of all these sins you've accused me of against God. Secondly, he asserts this. Uh, he must have been reading Calvin, an early proto-Calvin passage. He says, God can do as he pleases with him. The sovereignty of God. The Calvin thing was a joke. He asserts, <laughs> he asserts that God can do as he pleases with him, which is re- Reformed theology. God is sovereign. Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He does what he will uh, for his glory, and that's a good thing. We don't want a God who's up there saying, yeah, Gary, you kind of had a bad day, Psh, zap. Or, Gary, you had a good day, Psh, I'm going to bless you. You don't want a, a, a God who decides on whims. You want a God who decides on promises, on covenants. And that's what we have. Job dismisses Eliphaz and the others as miserable comforters. <laughs> These friendships are falling apart quickly. Uh, one translation says that they are, quote, his friends are comforters who increase trouble instead of ministering comfort to him. They increased his trouble. And so I know, I know from conversations uh, with some of y'all, and probably all of y'all have experienced this at some point, when you've gone through a situation that's painful or difficult, and you have some friends who bring comfort and, and healing and hope, and you have other friends who say the exact wrong things or just say, well, if you hadn't done this, you know, James, if you hadn't grown that mustache, this, this is okay. Uh, this wouldn't have happened, right? Um, you, we have those friends. This, this is, uh, Job says, you're miserable comforters. Um, in, verse, in chapter 16, verse 7 through 8, Job asserts that God and man are attacking him. In, in verses 9 through 14, Job makes some amazing statements about how he views God's actions towards him. And this is interesting. This is worth noting here. Uh, all of it's worth noting, but this is very interesting. Uh, he says God is like a ferocious beast in verse 9. He says uh, he uses the word traitor in verse 11. A wrestler, like a pro wrestler in verse 12. An archer, someone who is going to kill you with the bow in verse 12 and 13. And a swordsman in verses 13 through 14. That's, that's, that's not, hey, God, I have doubts about my salvation. That's not that. That is, God is killing me, and I don't know why. He's a swordsman. He's got bows and arrows. I don't know why this is happening. Very strong, honest language. And the word torn here is, usually, is the word used um, when a lion would come and attack a smaller prey and literally pull apart the animal. 
tear. That's what he says God's doing. God is like a lion tearing them apart. That's a very honest description here we have in Scripture that I think Christians can um, understand. If you've ever been through a difficult situation, sometimes it might feel that way. Um, The language of verse 14 is used to describe Job as a, a fallen fortress who is under a siege, is under siege, and the, the person attacking him is not the Babylonians, it's not the Hittites, it's not the Edomites, it's not the anybody you want to pick, the Assyrians, whoever. Who's attacking Job as a fortress? It's God. Very honest language. Uh, very honest language. Um, then in verses 15 through 17 of chapter 16, Job asserts that he is not suffering bravely for sins he has committed, nor is he offering a sacrifice to try to appease God. He still maintains his innocence. And then in verses 18 through 22 of chapter 16, Job appeals to the sky and the heavens to be witnesses of his innocence. He's appealing to creation. Um, Verse 19 uh, indicates Job has faith in his witness in heaven to vindicate him. Verse 22, he implies that he expects this suffering to lead to his death. Uh, It's puzzling here that Job envisions that his speedy death, here's the literary side of it, his speedy death may not happen soon. That's an interesting idea. It's a speedy death, but it may not happen soon. So Job is struggling here. Job is wrestling through suffering. In chapter 17, um, let me back up here. It's important to remember when we're reading through the Bible, um, we have a break between chapter 16 and 17. That, that's something that's been placed in there in the last few centuries. Uh, that, that's not in the original uh, Hebrew. Um, so Job is continuing. So when you get to 17, he's just continuing his thought. Uh, In chapter 17, verse 1, there's three uh, grammatical clauses with two words apiece. And Job basically says, my my spirit is ruined or broken, and my lifespan is complete. Kind of feels like Ecclesiastes, the preacher, the teacher in Ecclesiastes. For Job, in his mind, only the graveyard is next. How how about some positive self-help theology there? Only the graveyard is next for him. And then the next three verses actually form a Hebrew oath formula. In 17, starting verse 2, Job is using the language of a courtroom, the language of a judge, that binds God to punish his friends as mockers. And so really what, what's happening here is, it's Job handing over his friends to, a, to God's tribunal for God to judge his friends, because Job has gone through so much suffering, and his friends have piled on and said, well, it's because of your sin. And Job says, okay, what's the sin? Like we covered last, last few weeks. So Job is handing over his friends uh, to God's tribunal for, them, for God to judge them. Uh, and Job is willing to take that risk because he, this is a suffering man, but one of the, the, the themes you see is Job suffers, but he's also confident. He's confident that he, he, he has not done anything overtly sinful. He is a sinner, we should say that, but he's not been this horrific person where if you do this, then you're going to get punished. That's what he's, he's wanting to, to know. It's difficult to understand Job's thought if you look at verses 5 through 9. Uh, however, the main theme is that Job continues to accuse his friends. Uh, he's fighting, Job's fighting back. How about that? Job's fighting back. His friends have hurt him, now he's fighting back. Verse 5, for the eyes of their children to fail would be a proper punishment for someone who gives false testimony in order to defraud his friends, children of their inheritance. Um, there's got to be punishment for what they're doing. And so Job is giving a strong accusation to them. Uh, in verse 7, Job mentions his own problems with his own vision as a result of his suffering. So here you see a picture of his own physical suffering, his eyes. He's not seeing things clearly. Uh, and there's a whole, we talked about the first week, we'll come back to it probably at the end of Job, a whole list of the things that he's suffering from. So if you think this morning, if you're suffering from like one or two maladies or one or two issues, you know, something hurts, uh, Job's whole body's falling apart. Um, and he doesn't know why. Uh, verse 9 of chapter 17 seems to indicate that Job's confidence in his own innocence is growing stronger and stronger. He's getting more and more resilient in saying, I need answers. I I didn't deserve this. In verse 10, he attacks the wisdom of his friends again. And then in verse 11 through 16, Job returns to the subject of his body, which is falling apart. Um, Verse 12 is hard. It's kind of an obscure uh, word used in that verse. It could be in verse 12 that Job is moving from life to death, or it could be an accusation that his friends have different moral values than he does. So think of Isaiah 5, verse 20, 
those that call good evil and those that call evil good. And we see that in our culture today, um, everywhere. Um, and it's difficult at the end of chapter 17, Job, the final part of Job's response here, it's, it's difficult to determine Job's mood here. It's hard to know if he is eager for death or if he fears death. It's hard to see where he's at. So I think you just have, you have a picture of a man who is um, searching for anything, and probably like we talked about with King David uh, has in the Psalms, he's just ups and downs. One day he is uh, fighting back against his friends. The other day he just wants it to be over. So you see a man who's just struggling, holding, trying to hold on uh, for anything. Uh, let's look quickly. We'll look at Job, eight, Job 18, then we'll stop there so we can talk. This is Bildad. Uh, we'll look at uh, Mr. Bildad. It is his second speech to Job again. Uh, and it's a straightforward, um, it's really a monologue on the fate of the wicked. Um, Bildad here emphasizes external problems, um, things outside. So in verse 3, if you look at verse 3, Bildad seems concerned about his own reputation, perhaps more than meeting the needs of Job. And then Bildad begins to use Job's words against him which some scholars say means, potentially means, that Bildad has run out of ideas. And so he just, it's like when you're in a discussion with somebody, um, and you're, uh, I'm not going to use any illustrations. Uh, I was going to use a couple from, from Chuck, but that wouldn't be good. Um, and you start using someone's word against them when you're in an argument. You've done that, right? It means you have nothing else to say, and so you start pulling ideas and say, well, you just said that. It means you have nothing left to say, right? We've all done it. Uh, that, that seems, to be, uh, seems to be what's happening, that he's run out of ideas. In, if you look back in, in chapter 16, verse 9, Job had identified God as his torture, but here Bildad asserts that Job is doing this to himself. Um, and you probably dealt with that in your life when things have gone bad and people say, well, you've just done this all to yourself. Yeah, that, that may be a half-truth. There might be some truth in that, um, but not for Job. And if you remember back in chapter 14, verse 8, Job used the illustration of, of soil eroding to describe his life. And now Bildad is joking about the earth being reconstructed around Job. So he's taking his, his words and saying, oh, I heard you say that, and I'm going to use this against you. So this is a man desperate for ideas. And then to, to finish Bildad, and then we'll have, we'll have some discussion here, verses 5 through 21, Bildad once again claims the moral order, the natural order of life, with the Creator is fixed. There are rules that always happen. The wicked are always put to shame, and the righteous are always rewarded. That always happens. And Bildad uses various images to convey this idea, and then we'll finish with this. He uses the idea of darkness in verses 5 through 7. It's just like darkness. Then he goes on to hunting in verses 8 through 10 and uses six different Hebrew terms to describe hunting. And then in verses 11 through 13, he uses illness. Um, verses 14 through 15, he uses the idea of, of robbery. Um, and there's that phrase, king of terrors, uh, which is a reference to death. Um, in verse 16, there's the idea of a drought. Um, and he's using the imagery here that Job is like a, a tree that has, has its roots dried up. And he's saying, Job, that's you. Um, and these words are pretty cruel because, like I said, Job has used them. And he's using these words, Bildad is using these words against Job. So not a great friend. And then he finishes in verses 17 through 19 with talking about being childless or being barren, that kind of idea. So he's using darkness, hunting, illness, robbery, drought, childless, childlessness uh, to describe the moral order is always fixed, Job, and if you're suffering, it's because you've done A, and now B will happen. It's a fixed order. So uh, I'm going to stop there so we can have uh, 10 or 15 minutes to have some discussion.